it'll be uh, projected on the wall. So let's uh, let's say it together, huh? The Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified.
Sarah. I understand Randy Simonson was not doing well this week, so continue to pray for her. I had heard that as well, so let's keep Fran Simonson in our prayers here also. Yes. I'd like to thank God for a healthy delivery of your grandson. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Very challenging situations there. <coughs> Ed. My friend Don, he has to have fluid drain twice a week from his one lung, and it's shortening his life. We'll lift him up in prayer. Debbie. Praise God. Praise God for answer prayers there. One, two. Oh, there you are. Paul, <laughs> we need a prayer for my nephew. He's been, he's been in the Navy and he came home Friday evening and his brother's wedding and Friday night he came down with a kidney stone. And he sat with home for two, two or three years, flew in and bam, kidney stone. So somehow he's got With all these things we have mentioned, as well as those in our hearts and minds we have not spoken aloud, let's go to our Lord in prayer, and we'll conclude with the words of the Lord's Prayer, which you can find at that time on the screen behind you. So, uh, let's go ahead and pray. The Lord, we thank you for answered prayers. The Lord, for, for healthy deliveries. The Lord, for recovery from COVID for Debbie's uh, positive MRI. Uh, Lord, we praise, we praise you that uh, Maria and her baby are, uh, are doing better. We pray, Lord, for continued recovery there. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for Carol with her uh, continued recovery from knee surgery. Lord, for Ethan and, and Ed, each dealing with kidney stones. We pray for Brian and Amanda and Bob and Diane and all of those who are struggling with COVID. Lord, we pray for healing for them. Lord, we lift you those who are making difficult decisions. For Mary and her father and the health situation there. Lord, we pray for those in positions of authority. Lord, for school boards and administrators. Lord, grant them wisdom on how to address this COVID situation. Lord, we pray for our leaders at all levels of government. May they have the wisdom to do what is right and good for all people. Lord, we pray for those who serve. We thank you for their sacrifices. We pray, Lord, that you will watch over them. Grant them also the courage to do what is good and right in the course of their duties. Uh, Lord, we pray for, for Dawn, for Franny. Uh, Lord, for, for those who are expecting, we pray, Lord, for safe deliveries. We ask, Lord, that you will abide with us. 
We pray, Lord, that you will comfort those who sorrow. We pray that you will encourage those who are stumbling, struggling. Lord, lift up those who are weak and broken. Lord, may we who are weary find rest in you. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace towards us, for your love and compassion. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray also after the pattern that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing the doxology with us as our elders bring forth this morning's offering. Let's stand and sing. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John. John chapter 17, starting at verse 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord Jesus, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours. Yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I, I consecrate myself, that they may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that I and you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray to open it to us, the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might understand what it says to us. That your Holy Spirit will be here among us. The words that are spoken and the things that are heard and remembered and taken to heart not be from me, Lord, but from you. That the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Teacher was asking in her class, how did you spend your summer vacation? One student replied, we visited my grandmother in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Well, very good, said the teacher. Can you tell the class how to spell that? Actually, said the student, now that I think of it, I think we went to Ohio. <laughs> Some questions are easier than others. The question of what sets us apart from the world and binds us together as Christians can be a tough one. I mean, we know the answer is Jesus. But as we try to look deeper into that question of what is the basis for our unity, what is it that we believe that, that draws us together, the question can get a little complicated. But as this morning scripture shows, it's an important question. Jesus cares about the unity of his followers. Today's text takes us into the gospel according to John. As a matter of fact, we find ourselves very close to the end of the gospel of John. This is the last evening Jesus spends with his disciples. And he prays to the Father. He says, Father, I am coming to you. And so on this occasion, he is praying for his disciples. As he's getting ready to leave them, send them out into the world. But we know that Jesus returns after the resurrection. He spends time with his disciples there. But the dynamic is very different. This is the last time Jesus and his disciples are all together as that close-knit group that traveled around Galilee, into Judea, back and forth to Jerusalem, through Samaria, even out into the Gentile areas north and east of the Sea of Galilee. That tight-knit group of companions is about to, to be broken. Jesus knows what, what's coming. And even the disciples have an inkling that something momentous is about to happen. And so Jesus takes this opportunity, that his last evenings with his disciples, to really equip them for what is coming. And as he's praying for them, he intercedes with his Father for them. And what Jesus shows here in this prayer is that he really values unity. That's the big theme running through these verses. Jesus wants his followers to be unified. He prays, keep them in your name, 
which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He prays, I do not ask for these only, but also for all those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. And that's you and me, by the way. Because the word of God went from those first disciples out into the world and down through the generations until it came ultimately to you and to me. To those whom we will tell about Jesus. Even here in Huntington, Ohio. He prays that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Jesus cares about the unity of those who follow him. He wants us to reflect the unity he has with the Father. He knows that that kind of unity is essential to our witness in the world. And this is a kind of unity that goes far deeper than the ways we usually sort ourselves out. The New Testament shows us how the gospel cuts across every social division in the ancient world. Those who came to Christ were rich and poor, slaves and free, Romans and non-Romans, Jews and Gentiles, members of every nation and ethnic group. What they found in Christ was far more significant than the other things that used to define their identities. And we see a hint of that even today in the church. We have people from all different backgrounds. We didn't all go to the same schools. They don't all work at the same jobs. Don't all cheer for the same baseball team. You might not even like the same kind of music or even vote the same way. But there is something in Jesus that we have found that is more significant than all of those things. But, you know, if we take a good look around and we're really honest, we have to acknowledge that the church today really kind of struggles with this unity thing. I mean, we understand that there's only really one church, the universal church, made up of all those who believe in Jesus from every time and place. That's what the Apostles' Creed means by the Holy Catholic Church. Church, As Greg mentioned earlier, a lot of people kind of get hung up on that phrase because they think it means the Roman Catholic Church. And it, it doesn't. Uh, Catholic simply means universal. There is just one church. In practice, though, Christians today are very divided. The Christian church first divided into Eastern and Western blocks a thousand years ago, and today there are many different expressions of Christianity at odds with each other. I mean, if we sat down and think about it, we could easily make a quick list of some of the major traditions in Christianity. The, the, the Methodists and the Lutherans, the Baptists and the Presbyterians, the, the Catholics and the Pentecostals. But even within those broad traditions, there are numerous denominations that don't all get along with each other very well. This isn't a huge problem in and of itself, having multiple different church bodies. Our unity in Christ doesn't have to be structural or organizational. But there is an issue here. Instead of trusting God to build his church out of all those he calls to himself, we prefer to pick and choose what our church families are going to look like. Many years ago, I spent the summer working for a, a traveling Christian day camp program. We went around to, to different communities and we'd be hosted by different churches and spend two weeks running a day camp program in the community. Uh, out of these churches. And one of the churches we partnered with was a, a, a large church, bigger than ours, and right downtown, the center of a size of a town in Pennsylvania. 
And right next door to this church was an equally large church of the exact same denomination. Uh, the story had been that a number of years ago there had been one church. There had been a fight over how to spend some money. Should we buy a new organ or send it to missions? Uh, one group got upset, decamped, affiliated with a different denomination, the same traditions, during a church the right next door. The two den denominations eventually merged into one. And so you end up with two churches. Same name on the sign. Same tradition, anyway. But operating completely independently of each other. Right next door. And, and we have to wonder, what kind of witness does this give to the world about those who follow Jesus? I don't think this is what Jesus had in mind when he prayed for the unity of his followers. Similarly, you can find many churches in this country who don't reflect the diversity of their communities. Now, here where we live in, in a rural area, uh, you know, there's one church in Huntington. We draw in all kinds of folks. But if you think about it, going to, to places where there's more population, more opportunities for church. It's remarkable how Christians sort of automatically gather with those who are most like them. I've never heard of a church that says, we only want one kind of people here, no one else is welcome. Every church says, we are welcoming to everybody. But it's remarkable how as you start going into a church, you, you see that they're, they kind of cluster together. Right? You've got the church where the rich people go and the church where the not-so-rich people go. You've got churches that, that really tend to have one ethnic group there predominantly, even though the surrounding community may have many different ethnic groups. You have churches where pretty much everybody votes one way or the other way. It's this kind of human nature that we fracture into groups of people who are most like us. The kind of unity that Jesus prays for, it doesn't just happen. There's got to be something that draws people together and keeps people together that is so much greater than our preferences and our affinities and the ways that we combine and divide as human beings. Some kind of basis for unity and community. And it's not just good feelings and good intention. Jesus' prayer gives us an idea of what that is, too. He says, I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. The foundation of our unity is the Word of God. The Word shows us truth so that we believe and receive a new identity in Christ. We are no longer of the world because we belong to Jesus. And so we are able to, to have fellowship and partnership with others in a way that transcends anything the world is able to offer. Thus, Jesus prays for his followers. Again, that includes us. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Christians should be one because we all believe the truth of the word of God. We are on this journey towards holiness, being sanctified by the word. Together. Of course, this raises then a pretty basic question. Even if we have all of this theology straight, what is it that the Word of God teaches? What are these truths that bind us together and that distinguish the Christian community from the unbelieving world? What is the basis for our unity? And that's where this question can get tough. Because on the one hand, we don't want to answer this question too loosely. Jesus does not preach unity for unity's sake but a unity that comes from obedience to God. 
In 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul exhorts the church, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Now, Paul's not saying that we shouldn't have anything to do with those who don't share our faith. After all, those are the, precisely the people whom Jesus sends us with the good news. Paul is saying, rather than believers and unbelievers, don't have any basis for the kind of God-focused partnership and fellowship we find in the church. And if you try to force unity, it's not going to go well. Like a team of oxen that aren't well matched and keep pulling in different directions. And we can look around the ecclesiastical landscape. And we can see where there are churches or whole denominations that have sought to simply be inclusive of absolutely everyone and everybody without that foundation of the truth of the Word of God. And it does not go well. There is a basis for our unity in the Word of God. And those who are not willing to accept that are not able to participate in the fellowship of the people of God in that way. Our response there should always be one of trying to reach out and trying to implore those who do not believe to, to come to faith in Jesus Christ so that they can be part of the people whom God has called together. We must stand on the truth, we stand on the word, or else everything falls apart. But on the other hand, we don't want to answer this question too rigidly. Because there are a lot of things that Christians don't agree on. There are debates about theology and biblical interpretation that have been going on for centuries. And some of these differences are very significant. But many of them are not significant enough to present a bar to fellowship or warrant division in the church. And yet again, when we look at the history of Christianity, we see that so often they do. There's a long history of disagreements schisms and splits. And I am sure make Jesus weep because they are divisions over things that should not cause division within the body of Christ. There's a great, great quote, and I'm not sure if anyone's really ever figured out who originally said it because it gets attributed to all sorts of people in church history. It goes like this. In essentials unity, in non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In other words, there are certain points that are essential to the Christian faith in which we must have unity in order to be the church in obedience to God. There are other points about which Christians should be free to disagree, and we should not harm the unity of the church by forcing everyone to either agree with us or get out. And we should always seek to embody the love of Christ in the midst of these discussions. But of course, we're still left with the same question. What are the essentials, the things that Christians have always believed and must believe in order to claim the name of Christ? Fortunately, our spiritual ancestors have left us with some tools to figure this out. We call these things creeds. They're expressions of the faith that believers have composed often long ago. Oftentimes the creeds would be used in a worship setting, particularly in a baptismal setting. If someone is about to claim the name of Christ and be baptized, they would first confess their faith 
using this formula of the creed. It covers the main points that people need to know about. As a matter of fact, our church constitution declares that this church claims as its own the faith of the historic church expressed in the ancient creeds of the church and reclaimed in the basic insights of the Protestant reformers. It affirms the responsibility of the church of each generation to make its faith, this faith, its own. Or to put it another way, we agree with our spiritual forebears about the essentials of the Christian faith, and we're committed to learning and understanding them for ourselves. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to explore these essentials using the framework of the Apostles' Creed. So what we use for our call to worship this morning. The Apostles' Creed isn't in the Bible. We shouldn't give it the same level of importance that we do to the Word of God. In fact, it's not even directly from the Apostles, despite the name. The Apostles' Creed dates back to the second century, and it simply summarizes what the Bible says and what the Apostles taught. But it's still very helpful for us today. I like to think of it like this. When I was a teenager, my church youth group would take a backpacking trip every summer to the mountains of North Carolina. We would go out into the wilderness and experience God, just camping, being together, uh, undertaking this task of going from point A to point B every day. But, you know, we didn't do this alone. We didn't just drive a church van into the wilderness and get out and start wandering around the woods. That would not have gone well. We worked with a ministry that put together these kinds of experiences. And that ministry made sure that we had the right equipment. It made sure we had enough food. And it provided us with a guide. Now, the first thing the guide did was taught us how to use a map and a compass. Because the guide didn't just get out in front and say, okay, everybody follow me. We still had to do that. That was our job. We had to read the map. And so the guide would say, all right, today we need to get to this point. How are you guys going to do it? get the map, get the compass, hopefully figure out the right way to get there. And if we got off course, the guy didn't stop us right away. He was usually hanging out at the back of the line. But occasionally he'd drop some kind of comment like, you guys check the map lately? Does this look like a trail to you? And if we were paying attention, we knew, oh, okay, we probably made a wrong turn somewhere. And we'd get back on track. And having the guide was really helpful because in case there was an emergency, the guide knew how to call for help. The guide knew where we had to go in order to, to get back on track, get the assistance that we needed. Creeds are kind of like that. Simply because you say a creed or memorize a creed like I had to do in confirmation class. Or even say, yes, I believe in the creed. That's not, that's not a substitute for having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a substitute for reading the Bible and knowing the Word. It's not a substitute for understanding God's call on your life and doing the work of figuring out, of here's where I am and here's where I need to be in my walk with Jesus. And following the Holy Spirit to get there. The creed is not a substitute for any of these things. But it is wisdom, handed down from generations past. And if you pay attention to it, it will show you how to navigate these questions of the Christian life and the landscape of the church. If you're paying attention, it will give you clues that you've gone off track if you're really wandering away from the unity of the church. And it can be a great comfort in moments of crisis and point you to where you can find the help that you need. So what we're going to do, again, over the next few weeks is we're going to use the Apostles' Creed as a framework to study what, what are these essentials of the faith 
that give us a firm foundation on which to build and show us what it is that brings us together. Creed comes from the Latin credo, means simply, I believe. And it's called a creed because that's what the first line of the creed is. Credo, I believe. Believe in God, the Father Almighty, and so on and so forth. It's a statement of faith. And it is through our common faith, our assurance of things hoped for, and conviction of things not seen, as Hebrews 11, 1 puts it, that we have unity with God and with each other. This is where we find unity. Within the walls of this church, with other believers around the world, all of those who have been saved from sin and death by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for us. We believe that what Jesus has done for us is greater than anything that may divide us. So let's explore this truth together. Let's live this truth. Let's stand on this truth until the Lord comes again. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he invites you to come to this table where we find communion, unity, with all those who believe, all those who have gone before, all those who trust in Jesus around the world. We have this common faith that our only hope in life and in death is that on the night he was arrested the Lord Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me as we gather at the table we remember the Lord Jesus gave his body, gave his life for you and for me. Take and eat. same way after supper the Lord Jesus took the cup. He gave it to his disciples to say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Poured out for the remission of sins. Drink all of it. Of it. It is only through the blood of Christ that our sins are washed away. That we are made whole. We are made clean. We are made one with our Creator again. That relationship is restored. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Take. stand as we conclude our service singing together our closing song.
Just a reminder to uh, those with just a reminder to those of you with uh, children fifth grade and up. We are having a youth group this evening, and uh, I'd like you to wear some good sturdy shoes for that because the, uh, the weather outside is beautiful, and so hopefully we'll be able to get outside and uh, do something a little more active tonight for our activity. Now, may our great God and Savior. To whom be honor and glory and power and strength forever and ever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, abide with you and bring you comfort, mercy, and truth this day and always. Amen.